It's just coloring maps, isn't it? Geography is just coloring maps. That's all it is. That's all I remember from school. And naming, naming capitals of countries. That's that's pretty much all it is. Right? No, it is a kid. A kid because I love. Um, well, I was going to ask about oceans. Not even remotely. Did you watch the original Oceans 11 in that class or the, or the remake? I think it was the remake. Not the one with Francis. I, was fall, I fell asleep, so I couldn't really tell you, but I'm 99% sure it was the remake. With George Clooney, man? Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> not, the, not the original with Frank and Andre no, and the Rat Pack. Oh, that's not. such a cool movie. Not the remake. Too. So that's our blue recommendations for today's class. Both <laughs> versions of Ocean's Eleven. Watch them both. Um, okay, so everything we've talked about so far, all the inferential procedures we've talked about, I've looked at differences between means. Every single one, right? So be they Z tests, T tests, F tests, whatever. It's always, is this group different than this group? Are these groups different from each other? Whatever. And that's a pretty common question. The other question, which is intimately related to it, is, is there a relationship between the independent and dependent variable? Indeed, it's kind of the same question. Because if I say, are two groups different, I'm saying, is there a relationship between the independent and dependent variable? The independent variable I manipulated and changed it, and then I measured two things, the dependent variable, is there a relationship? We still tend to think of it that way, but they really are the same question in a lot of respects. Yeah? Okay. You see what I'm saying, though? Like it's, it, these are not unrelated questions. And in fact, with a continuous variable or uh, a discrete variable that has many, many levels, it's actually easy to see a relationship. So if we think about, I mean, I don't know, uh, retention interval and percent correct recall. Okay? And so we have up to 100, 50, and of course, zero. You know, after a few minutes, it's here. And we might know that at some point it gets, eh, after a bit of week, it's going to be, if it's a list, say 20 words, here around 10, 15 percent. But we know, in fact, and you know this if you take memory or learning or intro psych, one hopes, the forgetting curve kind of looks like this. And we could, in fact, have all kinds of different levels in here. So you can start to see a relationship. In that case, it's a curve. Approaching the x-axis. But a lot of times we'll have a variable, so it's almost a continuous variable, or a variable, as I said, that's discrete that has many levels. Here's, a, here's an example. Let's pretend that IQ and income are that tightly related. If only it were so. Um, IQ and income are quite related to each other, uh, which shouldn't surprise you. IQ, one of the things it measures is it correlates highly with school achievement. Um, school achievement correlates highly with income, just the way the world works. It isn't close to that tight, and it isn't close to that kind of slope. And we all know there are outliers. We all know of I don't know. Kind of dumb athletes make a great deal of money. Or dumb I don't know. Musicians. Right? We also do know that there are people who are smart that don't make very much money. As a rule. Again, not quite that tight. When I was making up these data, which I just completely just made up numbers, uh, I was obviously thinking wishfully. I'm trying to say I'm smart and I want more money, is what I'm trying to say. I'm going to make that perfectly clear. Okay, so let's move this out of the way. The scatter plot, of course, actually is a really useful exploratory data analysis tool. I didn't mention we'll talk about EDA, but it's a really useful EDA tool. Um, if you 
collected data like this and just did a scatter plot, which is a really simple thing to do in, what did I use to make that? Uh, numbers on a Mac. But you can do that in, in, in Excel or in Google um, spreadsheets, SPSS, of course. If you've got a variable like this that has a lot of levels, a lot of different levels, almost continuous, doing that right away tells you, what did I find? Right, right away, you can look at that and go, oh, I see there's a relationship between IQ and uh, income. Okay. But you can see it right away. It's not difficult to see. Now it's a matter of just doing some inferential procedure to, to determine that this isn't right random chance to make this happen. So we need a way to standardize these variable relationships even if they have different scales. So if this is IQ and this is income, if IQ is measured in on your score on the, on the, uh, the WACE, or it's your score on the Raven Progressive Matrices test, and your income is in US dollars or Euros, the relationship should look the same. You should be able to standardize it somehow. So that's what we're after. A start here, this isn't going to quite get us there, but a start here is something called covariance. Covariance, and if you look at this first, you say, what? But let's break it down a bit. You'll see that what this is, covariance of x and y, it's the sum of almost squares, <laughs> but they aren't quite squares because it's not x bar, x minus x bar squared. It's x minus x bar and y minus y bar. That's two things together, right? The top, the bottom is the number of degrees of freedom like you would have in a variance calculation. It's the top part, the numerator, the fraction, is instead of x bar, or x minus x bar times x minus x bar, right, x minus x bar squared, it's x minus x bar, y minus y bar. Y bar is just the average of the y's. So you have x's. This measures the degree to which two variables vary together. It tells us if x moves, does y move? And by how much? So if deviations from x bar and y bar go in the same direction, in other words, if you have an x bar that is higher an x that is higher than x bar, higher than average, and a y that is higher than y bar. Does, does that mean typically y is higher than y bar? Or if x is, if your x value is less than the average, is your y value then necessarily less than the average? If they do, they go together, you have a positive covariance. This is different between covariance and variance. Covariance can be negative. And I think you should be able to see this, that if the first part here, x minus x bar, is positive and this is going to be negative, that means they go in different directions. Okay? So if deviations of x bar and y bar go in the same direction, you get a positive covariance. Otherwise, you get a negative covariance. So covariance, unlike variance, can be negative. Questions so far? So is covariance like the same thing as correlation then? No, it gets us to correlation. Okay. This will get us there. Because remember, I said at first, like, it'd be great if we were measuring IQ with different, let's pretend that two IQ tests measure exactly the same thing, and we know they don't, let's pretend. Then it didn't matter which IQ test you use, or it didn't matter what we were reporting our income in. But if I report my income, which I just did on Sunday, I did my taxes, <laughs> if I reported my income in cents, it's much more impressive than it is in dollars. Right? Now, if we did our incomes in cents here, the variance would look huge. But we know it's really no different. It's just completely artificial. We've just added a couple of zeros, right? So this isn't going to take that into account yet because it's just deviations from means. And if I was, let's say I was doing height and weight. And 
if, if I was, um, yeah, even if I was just looking at variance, let's even ignore COVID. If I was just looking at variance in weights of people, and the Americans reported theirs in pounds, and everyone else in the world reported theirs in kilos, because everyone else in the world uses a, a sensible measuring system, <laughs> except for the United States, Liberia, and Myanmar. Way to go, USA. Um, so they're going to report theirs in pounds, and the rest of us report ours, even though I don't know my weight in kilos. Um, what's going to happen? Ours will look smaller. So will, Gee, people in Canada. A lot more of a standard kind of weight, but they people in the states it varies widely, and we know that's not true. We know it's because, in fact, in that case, I, we measured them in pounds and us in kilos. We want to be able to standardize that. Does anybody here actually know their weight in kilograms? I'm not asking for it. I'm just curious if you know it. Like I know what I weigh in pounds. Does anybody weigh themselves in kilos, ever? Does anybody mention, know their height in centimeters? Ah, uh -huh. see, I don't driver's license. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's not what you said. That is not a trap to, to show that you're insensitive about my disability. Uh, it's, it's, it's simply, you know, I don't, it's, you know, I've never, I've literally never measured my height. Like, I don't know it in centimeters. Yeah, like, I don't think we've ever, well, no, I don't, right. I've never measured. You don't know it, right? Like, but Just you know that you're five foot something, yes? Mm -hmm. See, I'm in that weird generation of, when I was in grade four, they said, oh, we're measuring it. And they taught us Imperial up till grade three. And then suddenly they went, yeah, well, now it's metric. <laughs> oh, grand. So there are things that I don't know how to measure. Yeah. Then there's like wood, you know? And um, anything around the house, I measure that in um, inches and sixteenths and thirty seconds, which is weird because, frankly, you could do it in millimeters and it would be just fine, but I don't do it that way. So, and then I'll look, I remember looking at my daughter and saying, I need a piece, I'm putting a tile floor, and I go find me a piece about five and three quarters. She said, I have no idea what that even means. So, anyway, that was a little aside. I enjoyed it. So we want to get, and Maria's right, we want to get to a point where we can get the correlation, which is, it's not going to care if we're measuring it in inches or centimeters or one IQ test or another or one currency or another or Fahrenheit or Celsius. We're not quite there yet because this will be affected by the unit. This will be affected by the unit. Other questions? Let me think here. All right. So we want a measure of association. We want one that doesn't care about the unit size. Well, we've got two standard, sorry, we want to standardize covariance is what we want to do. Because we're getting part way there with covariance. So the scales don't matter. We want the correlation between height and weight to be the same, or the thing we measure, you know, is a big correlation, uh, to be, if it's inches and pounds, or if it's, centimeters and kilos. Well, the covariance, if you take a look back at that, depends on S, uh, S sub x and y, S sub y. Take a look at that, just look at the, the equation. It's got what looks like, they're, they're, they're variations, they're, sorry, variances basically, or standard deviations. So why don't we just divide by that then? It's going to depend on standard deviation. So why not just divide by the standard deviation, which is what we end up doing. If it depends on that, let's divide by it. It's the same way we standardize. That's how we make a standard score, Z scores. We divide by standard deviation. So there's nothing magic here. It's actually a pretty sensible approach. So we're going to divide by S sub X and S sub Y. S sub y is the one for the y-axis, S sub x is the x-axis, that's all. That's why it's got a y this time, just to differentiate the two variables. All we're doing. Okay. 
Questions so far? Makes sense, right? It's not horrible. So what we have now is the Pearson R, which is the covariance of x and y, divided by the standard deviation of x times the standard deviation of y. The official name is the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient, but no one ever says that. So it's Pearson R. Maybe that's a former Canadian Prime Minister, Lester B. Pearson. No, it really wasn't. It really, really wasn't. It was invented a long time before he was the Prime Minister. It's a good thing before he was born, but that probably isn't true. So this takes covariance of x and y divided by standard deviation of x times standard deviation of y. There's your product. Right? So if the, if the absolute value of the covariance of x and y equals the standard deviation of, of x times standard deviation of y, what that's saying is, just to go the absolute value signs for a second, if the covariance of x and y, how much they vary together, equals the standard deviation of, of one variable times the other one, that means they're perfectly correlated. That means they are actually measuring the same thing. So if we had height in centimeters and height in inches as our two variables, the covariance of those two variables would equal the standard deviation of one times the standard deviation of the other one. It's giving you basically a ratio of how much the covariance is in all of the variance of those two variables. Okay. I probably should say variation instead of variance, because it's not really variance per se. <coughs> so it's a perfect relationship. Not unlike, I'm sure, the ones you all have with your boyfriends girlfriends, or husbands, or wives, or perhaps all four. <laughs> Look, I don't know what your lifestyle is. Just do whatever you want. As long as everybody's fine. <laughs> all right. The sign tells us simply the direction of the relationship. You know this from 2126, where I'm sure you learned a little bit about correlations. So if as x goes, if, if I, it's so near the end of the term. If as x goes up, y goes up, also as x goes down, y goes down, that means r will be positive because the covariance is positive. If as x goes up, y goes down, or as y goes up, x goes down, the covariance will be negative, and we will get, therefore, a negative value for r. All that does is show the direction. It does not talk about the magnitude of the relationship. r can only be between negative 1 and positive 1. It cannot be greater than 1. It cannot be less than negative 1. And the sign only indicates the direction of the relationship. It tells you literally nothing about the size of the relationship or how much the two variables vary together. It tells you nothing about it. Every year, well, back when I used to teach 21-26, which I haven't in a long time, but back when I used to teach 21-26, I would always have a question on a quiz, which correlation is bigger, negative 0.7, positive 0.4, or 1.5. Some people pick 1.5, and I told them it's not a correlation. It's a mistake. So that one's out. And then some people pick 0.4. I say, yeah, I know it's a bigger number, but it's not a bigger relationship. Negative 0.7 is the strongest, the biggest relationship. And I, was only, and I would actually use that example in class. I would actually say it. Yet, a third of the people get it wrong. Picking 1.5, that was the one that always got me. I said, but I told you, this is a thing. This actually says something. Can you not see that? 
Well, how would you get 1.5 then? Because you made a mistake. Like you did here answering this question incorrectly. I wasn't trying to be clever. I thought it was easy, that question. It hurt me off. This is why I don't teach 2126 anymore. I may be a little pedantic. It's not pedantic, really, is it? No. It's completely reasonable. That question's still there? Yeah, it probably is, because it probably originally came from me, and then it went to Dwayne, and then Dwayne gave it to me. But also, I give me own quizzes, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When you have a whole course worked up, and you have somebody who's coming in and saying, what my materials? It's like when I taught history of psych this year, most of the slides were based heavily on what Paul gave me, except I made them better, because I'm better than Paul. <laughs> Smarter, I can run faster. Because his, his legs really screwed up right now. Didn't he just have knee surgery? He had something, I don't know. I, yeah. I could definitely run him. <laughs> I think I could before that, though. Some quadricep, he like tore his quadricep? Yeah, something like that. That's not what I did on my sabbatical. <laughs> I, I created podcasts, man, about animal cognition at stickandtwitches.com. Questions about this? Pretty straightforward. You've probably seen a formula. In fact, you probably taught a formula in 2126 on how to calculate this. I can't remember what it is, and I don't care. It's called the computational formula. It's an easy way to calculate it. It's a, it's a formula that actually equals this, what I have here. It's just an easy way to calculate it. The reason it's taught is because it's an easy way to do it by hand. No one does these by hand anymore. So I'm not even going to talk about that. And I think this conceptually is way easier to get. If I was teaching 2126, which I'm not, because I don't want to, but I mean, that's not the only reason. We have competent people teaching. Um, I would teach it like this, I think. In the wood. I never make people do it by hand. So it's only straight lines, too. This is the other thing you have to keep in mind. This example I have here actually is. Excuse me. Um, never fail. That, that joke never fails. The sound comes out of somewhere. Oh, excuse me. It was weird, though, wasn't it? That was weird. <laughs> anyway, this is a bad example. Retention interval and um. Correct. No, this is a bad example because it's this is all by the way, this is true. The data actually looked like this in the world. This would not give us, and let's say we had data that fell right along this line, and we know that if it falls right along the line, we have a correlation of one or negative one. This wouldn't give us that because it's not a straight line. There are certain assumptions built into this that I haven't talked too much about here, but one of them is that the, the relationship is linear, it's a straight line. because of the way it's calculated. The math behind this, think about it, we're dealing with deviations from a mean. If we were to put a straight line here, sometimes it's above, sometimes it's below, sometimes, uh-oh. If you had a relationship that looked like this, classic sort of inverted U, like the Yerkes Dotson Law, right? You know the Yerkes Dotson Law? A little bit of anxiety isn't enough. Too much anxiety, we're ready to test. A little bit of anxiety, like hardly any, none. Not good, you're not motivated. Maybe you're asleep. Sorry, can I write a makeup test? I was asleep because I didn't have enough anxiety. <laughs> if someone said that to me, I might consider actually, yeah, okay, at least you've learned something. Over here, you're so worked up to get a panic attack. That's also not good. Somewhere in the middle is what we want. Right? And it's really pretty, the relationship. And that would give you a correlation literally of zero. Because you can't draw a straight line through. Now, there's an issue here, and that's that a lot of relationships that we have in Life sciences aren't straight lines. 
a lot of them you get like logarithmic decay, things like that, and or exponential curves. You gotta be very careful. In the more sort of, and I don't like this distinction because I don't think it's fair, but in the sort of social sciences, you get a lot more linear relationships. Or things that approach linearity that are good enough and will you we can assume linear. Now there are some, you know, uh, height and weight are gonna be linear, there's no doubt about that. you got to keep that in mind. This is one of the reasons you do a scatter plot before you do some correlation coefficient thing, is because you've got to look at it and say, can I actually use this statistical technique or not? Right? Okay. Questions? Okay, this is stuff you probably don't. It'd be cool if you could predict y from x. Like, if, if I was given your height, I can predict your weight, or vice versa. In fact, when you go, especially when you're a kid, if you go to a physician and they, they, they measure you, your height and your weight, and one of the things they tell your parents is, kid, weight's normal, everything's fine, right? You get that a lot, you measure, Measure with the weight, and then they say, "Yeah, right." And everything. You know what the, the you know what the doctors doing? Doctors already know this because they don't pay attention in stats class. Doctors, I got a buddy who teaches uh, medical students statistics, and he keeps trying to explain this. this is important. And they're like, "I'm going to be a doctor." Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to see You probably ought to also know how to read a research paper. Um, but all they're doing is looking up on a chart and they see this many centimeters, this many kilos. Done. That's fine. Which is actually exactly what they're doing. This is exactly what this is. So it's pretty neat if we could do that. Of course you can. Basically just by drawing a line through a scatter plot. Just drawing a line through a scatter plot. Where's my eraser gone? So, so if we had a scatter plot, I'll just put some dots on here. Is that two? I always like hearing people take notes on this because I hear like 15 people going. Um, okay. So here's a scatter plot. Nice scatter plot. I want to draw a line through it so I can predict y from x. So I could do, so let's see, I could draw this line, and what about that one? It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Okay, well, oh, wait a second. Assume these are, that's a straight line, by the way. Maybe it That's also good. It's hard to argue those two, but they're different, aren't they? So that would maybe even better. It's a compromise line. Between the two. Hmm. That's good. Now, some lines would be bad, like, that doesn't work. What if I could predict every single point perfectly? That would be by then. That would be magic. No, I can draw that line right now. So I can, I can, this is a perfect, perfect thing. See? I just, I connected. They're all done, look at that. Victory is one. But it turns out that's a really ridiculous line because I actually have to know all the points to make the prediction. That's a useless line, isn't it? Right, that point, that one, for those of you listening or watching the YouTube video, I just connected the dots. Hopefully you already connected the dots and figured out I was connecting the dots. That's comedy. So that's a really stupid line. Like, it's useless because I've actually, I need all the data to make the prediction. That's not a prediction anymore. Artists. <laughs> it's more like art. It's more like art. I asked the same question to my wife as finally, this is an art student. So I think the only thing that she has left to do is her thesis project for the next year. And I always say the same thing. 
I didn't know what it's done. And she can't tell me. And I've asked art professors here, how do you guys know when you're done? I don't think they know either. But they get things done and they're cool. Don't misunderstand me. I just don't know how everyone does it. Like my brother's a record producer, and I can get why he says, okay, that works. That bass drum sound is perfect. And I can tell whenever Dan Broadbeck has produced something I hear somewhere, because I can, I can, I can hear the Dan Broadbeck bass drum. Anyway. You know that song, The First Day of Spring? You might have heard a lot on YouTube yesterday, because people will be posting a song mm -hmm. by the good darkness. My brother was engineer and produced that all day. My brother is a famous record producer guy. Just a rock and roll professor Broadback who never went to, never finished high school. I'm not bitter at all. <laughs> <laughs> Him and his Juno Awards. Woo! Let's get a Grammy day and then we'll talk. <laughs> I'm very proud of my brother. Anyway. That line is so good. We, we, need it. we need some way to say, like, some of them are obviously better than others. This was the, the joke line's no good. But the line that is going the wrong way is wrong, too. Why is it wrong? Well, it doesn't make as good a prediction. We can, we can say that. We can feel that, right? But, so like art, it's like, but I can't really give you a reason why it's wrong. The most common approach we could use is just some way that we can all agree it's a good line. What we're going to do is minimize these squared deviations of the actual data points to the line. There's a couple of reasons. First of all, we can all agree on it. So mathematically, it's like, how'd you do that? I did it like this. Oh, okay. It's also easy. You ever taking maxima and minima of, equation, of, of, of equation systems in high school math? I'm not saying you never had to do it, but I'm asking if you remember doing it. It was something you learned to do. Probably like grade 11, right, in grade 12. It's something that is pretty easy to do. What's the maximum, what's the minimum? That's, so what we're going to do is we're going to get a minimum of an equation. That's a thing we can do. Right? Humans can do this easily. So it's going to look like this. Here's, here's four dots, four points. And we have y. Those are the points, and we have y hat, which is the predicted line. And I know it should be y circumflex, but it's not. It's y hat. <laughs> Every year I think the same thing. I have a friend, a buddy, who, who I see at a conference, and I'm going to see him in April, but it's always after this course is done, because Sylvain Fisset, and he's from. Uh, uh, University of Montana Edmonds done and, and, and he does in fact he's this third talk the whole he'll probably be sitting right near me I'm gonna have to I, actually ask him because I think he teaches stats too and I because I want to ask what do they call that they, there's no way they call it Y chapeau <laughs> chapeau no no one says that I think the law in there just the end just to be a good Quebec kind of thing there yeah? it's the Y avec un chapeau no? they call it in the bin some of these jokes are just for a very small number of people in here that know <laughs> non-swearing in French. That's like I, it's like saying fudge, call in, instead of saying something else. It's a very well-learned French thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I learned to speak French by hanging around people from Quebec. That's you know. I can also swear like a sailor in French, but it's not as good. So, let's minimize the sum of these deviations. Y minus Y hat. God, it, gets, it is hot in here. No, that's the conference t-shirt. Comparative Cognition Society, Melbourne, Florida. I will ask, I'll have to ask Sylvain this year because I always forget. Okay, do you see what we're doing? This is really pretty straightforward. Now we can say, so it's going to be, which this is not bad, it's probably wrong a little bit. I just, I eyeballed this and drew it, so I'm not saying it's right. But the idea here is we'd make this as small as possible. 
make those deviations as small as possible. <coughs> and we split them because some of the, some of the values be negative, some be positive. So we want to make that quantity itself as small as we can. Questions. So what we end up with then is a prediction equation. Y hat equals a plus bx. And it is called y hat, by the way. I know that sounds stupid. I feel foolish saying it, but it is called y hat. So it's the predicted y equals the intercept. That's where, the, where um, x equals 0, where it goes through the y axis, and the slope. And yes, I realize almost certainly you were taught in school that it was y equals mx plus b, and m was the slope, and b is the intercept. Not anymore. They just, I don't know why, but I, it's not my fault. Just get off my back. The other way to look at this would be, there's a little more general way, which is, I wish we taught it this way typically, so I'm just going to mention this, would be y hat equals b0 plus b1 x1. Okay, that's a general way to So b0 would be the uh, intercept, and b1 is the slope. You're going x1, oh. Spoiler alert, it can have more than one x. That would have to do that. We're not going to do that. Okay, questions? Did you learn about this in 2026? Yeah. Yeah? Good. Did you calculate it ever? Yeah. That's horrible. Yeah. It's not, no, it's, it's something no one ever does by hand. It's probably good you did it once by hand. It's one of those things like, yeah, okay, that makes some sense to have done it by hand once. Just to show you that you don't use your, don't, you don't use your, your calculator to do that. <coughs> if you weren't interested in calculating it, you calculate B by taking the covariance of X and Y divided by the variance of X. So if you wanted to calculate, you could. It's actually easily calculable once you have covariates. The covariance thing's hard to calculate. It's what takes a long time. It's what takes a long time. And A equals the average of Y minus the B that you've already calculated times the average of X. I mean, look. People do. Nobody does these by hand. <laughs> There's too many places to make mechanical errors. It's like, look, nobody ever calculates variances by hand anymore. It's too easy to make a mistake. And it's also pretty easy to just scroll down and then type in uh, to a, sorry, first type into a, a cell in Excel equals VAR, and then you pick the, 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 the thing, and there it is. That's pretty easy to do. You find B and A like this. Again, uh, no one does this by hand. If I asked you what B or A were, you could certainly define it like this, but you could also tell me that B was the slope and A was the intercept, and I'd be perfectly happy. I find that the um, intercept because I was pretty good with this stuff in school, with, 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 with like big Cartesian geometry, I can look at that and go, oh, that makes sense why that's A. B is a little more conceptual. Okay, a little more conceptual. Okay. Questions so far? You're still good. Okay. Oh, please, right, yes, thank you. Okay, I'm just like, I'm looking back at old notes. Yep. And, like, it also says, like, I have your version of B, yeah. but it also says B can be equal to SY over SX. Uh, multiplied by Yeah, because in fact, if you went through and broke that back down, you, know, you put both of those things together, um, covariance of x and y, and then where you have s and um, that, 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 that. Okay. No, this is a good question. I was actually thinking about what you were, what I was saying, does anybody have any questions? I'm thinking of nobody ever asked this question. But that's good. <laughs> so it's covariance of x and y, divided by this, right? That's good. Yeah. And what's the one that you have? 
Um, I have. And I mean, it's what we have is true too. It's yeah. Um, it's S Y over S X multiplied by distance R. Now, do you see why those are equivalent? Because that, that, that's what R is. Covariance of XY, S sub X, S sub Y. The S sub X count, uh, cancel. So the S sub Y's cancel. And then we get S squared sub X, which is that. <laughs> it's, 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 so it's computationally the same. Algebra, it's magic. Yeah. I've always wanted someone to ask that question. Seriously. <laughs> all the years I've taught that in this course, no one's ever asked me that. I'm so happy you did that. Thank you very much. Okay. But it's a good question because it shows that, like I said, there are ways you calculate things that are done for convenience sake. These are called computational formulas. There's one for calculating all the different sums of squares in, 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 in analysis of variance that I never teach because I don't want to think of it that way. I want to think of it in, I want to get more of an intuitive feel for it. But both are right, and there's nothing wrong with the other way. That was, I'm just glad, I'm glad somebody finally asked that. Yeah, so the S, Y's cancel, we end up with SX times SX down here, S, S sub X times S sub X is S squared sub X. So it's the covariance of X and Y divided by S squared sub X. Yay. Other questions? Okay. Now, if we're going to interpret this equation, we have A, which is the intercept, and that's where x equals 0. And it's not always meaningful. It is sometimes, but it is not always meaningful. So if we had what's a possible relationship here, let's say x is going to be yeah, yeah. years of education will be on x, and income will be on y. It's positive correlation. You get a positive slope. You'd have an intercept. In that case, it might be meaningful. Maybe there are the, not that many people left in, 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 in the Western industrialized society anymore that have no education, but there may be some. So maybe that's useful. What about if we had age and Does the zero make any sense? <coughs> Probably not. Not a lot of your top newborn babies are playing the field. <laughs> right? That make any sense. It's, it's a ridiculous. I, mean, I said mates instead of sex partners because I get all creeped out this. I'm trying to think of something else. What about, what about um, we could have something like even height and weight? I bet there's an intercept value there, but no one's zero centimeters tall. That makes sense. Or no one has no mass. Hmm. So the intercept is actually usually, it's all, in fact, usually you don't, you don't uh, interpret the intercept. It's more of a mathematical art artifact. It's tempting as hell to interpret it. It's so tempting to say Oh, I see. So if you had no education, this is why it's sort of a bad example. It's sort of actually a good example. No one has zero years of education in here. Right? There's nobody like that. Everybody's going at least to some elementary school. And now you're mandated to go to school until you're 18, right? When I was a kid, you had to go until you were 60. You quit school grade 11. But even then, 
that's 12 years, including kindergarten. Before that, it was this is back a long time ago, you had to go to school up until grade eight. Before that, grade six. Before that, as well, you had to go to school because uh, that it was a harvest. How many years are Colonializing. But nowadays, zero years of education, especially if we took, for example, the people in our society today that actually work. People who work, okay, people with jobs, employed people. There is no one out there with zero years of education. It may have been a shitty education, it may have been an education they didn't care about, they didn't try, but they were in the school. We don't have people in Canada anymore that never went to school. We used to, but that's not a thing anymore. Or it's such a small number of people who wouldn't show up in the data set. Yet we would look at this thing and go, so with zero years of education, I can still make 21 grand a year? So it's so tempting, but it's almost always meaningless. It's a mathematical artifact, so you can draw the plane. Right? Again, linear relationships. So you cannot have a situation where you have, I don't know, like a like a forgetting curve. You know, it's not going to work. Oh, by the way, there are ways. There are ways to um, deal with those. It's and they're very similar. So nonlinear relationships. All you do is you don't fit a straight line. You fit a, a certain kind of curve. You have to know a bit, a bit more about math to do that. But it, it's doable. It's not like it's not doable. Okay. How do you know? Well, one way is looking at. A scatter plot. The other way is to look at the residuals. The residuals are those prediction errors, y hat minus y. Or y minus y hat, no matter. So a residual is prediction. So if we had, <coughs> we get what's called the residual plot. They're called E, E for error. And if along here we have x, okay, along the x-axis, what we should get is a scatter plot around x, or sorry, around zero. It overpredicts as much as it underpredicts. That's what we should get. And then, then we probably have a certain line relationship, and that's what we, you know, we hope to get. But what if we had something like this instead of the nice straight sort of cloud? What if we had that? What would that tell you? Does that tell you anything about the shape of the curve we have? It's probably a curve. It's probably not a line. Because it under predicts, then it over predicts, then it under predicts. Now, right now, you'd say, maybe I can just do a scatter plot. Yeah, you could. But eventually, when we have more than one x variable, like we will starting on Thursday, when we have maybe four x variables, four predictors, I challenge you to think in five dimensional space. You can't. It's hard enough thinking in three. It's hard enough thinking in two. There's not even depth to the graph. Right? So, this is why you think about residual plots. So, you look at these residuals. <laughs> you should, in fact, see if you were to measure the covariance of the residuals and the x variable, it should be zero. There should, there should be no relationship whatsoever. Residuals should be completely random around x. So if you do have, if you do have a curve. You think, well, I gotta do a different procedure. Or if you do have, now it may not be that you have a curve like this, maybe you just have the 
prediction error gets bigger as x gets bigger. Uh oh, that's another problem. It's a possibility. And again, that's probably what scale. That's probably one where you have to transform. This is like the whole transform of your data thing. That's probably what you have to do here. Probably you're going to have to take the logarithm of something. This is probably a case where you've got uh, something that's exponential. Yes. Yeah. Now, again, you can usually, and you may not be mathematically sophisticated enough to look at a, a graph and go, well, I know what the equation would be if it's not a straight line. But you know what? You'll know somebody who is, and you look and they say, oh, that's um, a parabola. So you have to fit a square function, not a straight function. And that's something that's doable. In fact, most software, you can say, I'm not going to do linear regression. Which is what this is called. I'm going to do quadratic regression. So it's not like it's impossible. It doesn't come up much. Don't go outside the range. This is the other thing that's tempting. It's the horizontal opposite of the intercept being completely useless. It's very tempting to go outside the range of your data to make ridiculous predictions. You know, think about this. I don't know, what's minimum wage? What is it? Is it $11? I think it's like 11 25 Okay, it's eleven twenty-five. So if you work eight hours a day, so that's 40 hours a week, right? <coughs> what do you get? $11.25. That's 90 hours a day times five. Four fifty a week. Well, what if I worked double time, 16 hour days, I make $900 a week? What if I never did anything but work? I make $1,350 a week. Wait a second, what if I also worked in the weekends? That adds an, an extra. Well, wait, if weeks were like, if days were way longer, if they were like 45 years long, I make millions. That's what you're doing when you go outside the range um, uh, of regression. But and again, the problem is, then you see how ridiculous that way of thinking is. That example is like, well, yeah, you wouldn't. That's stupid. Why would anybody say something so stupid? But if I have an equation that says, I don't know, let's say that uh, I'm making this up. Let's say that my salary equals. Quasi reason. But I don't want to use the actual equation. Because I don't really know it. And it's more it's not a linear thing. But anyway, let's say it's ten thousand times your years of working there plus sixty thousand. Let's pretend. That's not it. So let's pretend that's how you calculate a salary here at the University, and it's not. But that would say that our intercept was 60 grand, and then you get $10,000 a year, if only it were true. <laughs> so, uh, I've worked here for 11 years, so that gives me 60 plus, what, 110? Jesus, if only this were true. So that means I make, yeah, right, like I make that much money. Okay, right. but let's pretend I make that much money. So again, let's pretend I'm an administrator who actually is in the classroom. So, maybe I'm not too subtle there. So, anyway, this is very tempting. You look at that and go, oh, I see. So what if you, what if you were a professor for 45 years? No one lives that long. But it's very tempting to look at that and go, oh, I can do that. I have math. Look, I have math right here. It's arithmetic. You can't, it's science. You can't argue with it. But you can. That's stupid. But it's so tempting when you have this beautiful thing. And it's just written out. And you've been taught all your life to trust things that have numbers and plus signs and equals in them. And then you're told, they look no, that can't be. It's very tempting. Really, really 
if you look at a height and a weight chart, it's like, well, what does somebody who is, how, how much would someone who was 45 feet tall weigh? What a stupid thing is that to do? But you're always tempted to go, oh, let's just figure that out, <laughs> you know? Don't do that. So you couldn't go outside the range. You don't go outside the range. And I, that's really not even close to myself. Way too long. Questions on this stuff? Does this makes some sense? I know you learned already in 2126, so it's sort of introduction back into this. I know I'm pretty sure you don't do multiple regression in 2126, where we talk about having more than one exer. And you've got to realize that almost everything, especially in the more sort of social science areas of psychology, everything is multiple variables, not just one. Some of you guys, I hope, hope all of you can go down. I know one of you not, uh, will be at the uh, honors thesis conference next Friday because one of, one of you has to present her honors thesis. So we know Samantha will be there. But when you guys take a look at those talks, you will see, in fact, that almost everything has more than one variable. Very few times when we just say, there's just this and this. It happens, but it's not very common. All right, questions? Start multiple regression. That's right, multiple regression. Our final topic on Thursday. Thanks, everyone.